Okay. So um, I'm going to start by just reviewing what we discussed, summarizing what we discussed last time. So we wanted to discuss massive particles. And since they pierce future time-like infinity, uh, it's not enough just to know what the gauge. We want to understand how large gauge transformation acts on such particles. Um, it's not enough just to know what the gauge transformation is doing at uh, null infinity. So we need to extend it into the interior. And there are various ways of doing that. But one way is to choose a gauge. Uh, d mu a mu equals 0, which implies that the Laplacian on epsilon is equal to 0. And one finds that uh, the solutions to this equation, if you fix epsilon on the boundary, that the solutions to this equation are much more nicely described in a hyperbolic slicing of Minkowski space um, given by ds squared equals minus d tau squared plus tau squared uh, d rho squared over 1 plus rho squared plus rho squared d squared x hat, where this is the unit 2 sphere. So it looked like this. These coordinates cover this quadrant of Minkowski space. We can have similar coordinates in other coordinate in other quadrants. And um, lines of constant tau look like that. And the cross section, uh, the, sorry, lines of constant tau look like that. And they are given by uh, ADS3, or constant negative curvature spaces. And it's sort of interesting that just starting with these large gauge transformations and harmonic gauge, one is naturally led to introduce this uh, kind of coordinates. And uh, as I said a moment ago, but I didn't write down, um, if we take epsilon uh, if we fix epsilon of zz bar to uh, obey du epsilon equals 0, so the large gauge transformation we want to study, we extend them in with this equation. We, found, we find that um, epsilon doesn't depend on the slice. And um, that was a very nice result because we also showed that uh, if we have a massive particle, a typical trajectory of a massive particle in uh, Minkowski space would, would be like that, goes from I minus to I plus, and asymptotically that becomes a line of rho equals constant, and the constant we worked out last time was the absolute value of the spatial momentum divided by the mass. And uh, that's the rho value. And the value of x hat is just the unit vector that you construct from the spatial momentum. And so once we know that, uh, since epsilon, as the particle moves towards i plus, epsilon will not change along its world line. And the wave function of the particle will get a phase uh, of, uh, if it's a particle of charge q, the wave function will get a phase of e to the i epsilon of rho x hat, the thing that we got by solving this equation, uh, times q. So it goes to that. So now we know how these large gauge transformations act on massive particles. 
And so now we can write down a word identity, which when you first write it down, uh, looks nothing like the usual word identity for, um, looks nothing like the weinberg soft theorem for massive particles. But indeed, after enough, uh, indeed, after enough work, one can show that this indeed reduces to the standard uh, weinberg soft theorem. Any, any questions about that? So that's just reviewing last time. Yes? No, a mu is not massive. A mu is the photon. That's always, always uh, massless. So when we, but when we, we, what we need to do is we need to act with a large gauge transformation on the outgoing state. And before we discuss the case where, for simplicity, where the outgoing state could be characterized by what was happening at null infinity. So we needed to understand how the large gauge transformation acted on the gauge field at null infinity. And that was very simple. It was just delta epsilon az equals dz epsilon. And if it was a massless field, delta epsilon phi massless field of charge q, which corresponding to a particle which pierced the sphere at null infinity at the point z and z bar, then uh, we got um, i q epsilon of z and z bar by q. This is the infinitesimal transformation. There I've written the finite transformation. This didn't work for a massive particle, because massive particles don't go out to null infinity. And we can't associate a point on the sphere with them. In fact, they might have, they might just have zero spatial momentum altogether, and then, then their their wave function is spherically symmetric. But still, we have to understand how to uh, act on them with large gauge transformations if we want to understand how this large gauge charge acts on the state. <coughs> defined in the future. And so we did that by extending the gauge parameter into the in interior using this uh, condition. Um, and um, we got a very nice and simple answer. And a bonus was that we, which is going to become more important as the things proceed, a bonus is that we already saw at this early stage that um, understanding how this whole structure of soft theorems in the case of massive particles uh, is very natural and kind of forces you into thinking about Minkowski space and hyperbolic slices rather than in the usual Minkowski t equals constant slices that we usually use. That's going to be a recurring theme. Um, any more questions about that story? Wait, Prahar, were you getting me some of that good chalk? Oh. Okay. So, um, all right. So. So the other thing that we discussed last time was what we do was the question of uh, non-perturbative status, both of the soft theorems and of the gauge symmetries. And we pointed out that, uh, in general, if you want to talk about a non-perturbative abelian gauge theory, in every example that we know of, there are also magnetic monopoles. And if you have magnetic monopoles in the external states, some scattering process and a magnetic monopole uh, comes out, magnetic monopole, 
you can attach a soft photon to that, and it's clear from it will couple to that, um, and, and it's clear that, um, and from the LSE procedure, it's clear that we'll still we can still get some kind of uh, pole there, and so it's clear that there's some kind of corrections, and we used a trick to figure out what these corrections were. We did uh, an electromagnetic duality transformation. That is, we defined F dual uh, with a usual as the Hodge dual of F, but uh, with the usual, with a conventional factor of four minus four pi over E squared, which makes some uh, formula simpler, simpler. And so we analyze the problem, and you can define this to be the uh, exterior derivative of the dual magnetic vector potential. And given an F, um, this defines an A dual up to, if we're in momentum space, up to something proportional to the momentum Q, and it would be E dual, that's a normalization factor, times the dual polarization vector, epsilon alpha, um, or polarization one form, since I've lowered the index, E to the I Q dot X. And then we showed, now, we're not assuming any kind of electromagnetic duality symmetry of the theory. We were just analyzing the theory rather than starting from scratch and trying to uh, calculate what the factors we are we get from diagrams like this, which we could have done without ever mentioning uh, dual electromagnetic frames. It would be kind of a nasty calculation because the vector potential becomes isn't globally defined, and you know it would be a nasty calculation. Rather than do that, we used a trick of just analyzing it in terms of these uh, different variables. It's a field redefinition, not a symmetry of the theory. And once we cast it in terms of these dual variables, it's completely equivalent to the problem that we already solved. And so we concluded that, in general, the soft factor, so remember that when we take the momentum of the external photon to zero, we get back the same amplitude uh, without the photon. Uh, in other words, the amplitude with a zero momentum, a, a very slow momentum photon is equal to the amplitude without the photon times the soft factor, where the soft factor is equal to the sum of overall outgoing particles of the momentum of the outgoing particles times the uh, charge EK, by which I mean QK times the coupling E, epsilon alpha, plus, this is the term we already had, PK dot Q, plus a correction factor, this is the term Weinberg had, and plus a correction factor, uh, which is the magnetic charge times the dual polarization vector, epsilon alpha, minus the same thing for incoming charges. Now, this formula only defines epsilon alpha. If you know the field strength, you can't get the vector potential. In momentum space, you can get the vector potential up to an addition of Q. So this epsilon alpha is ambiguous up to Q. So what do we do in this formula? Well, it doesn't matter. Because if we shift epsilon alpha every, if we shift epsilon alpha by Q, then we get PK dot Q on top. That cancels this PK dot Q. And we get the sum of outgoing magnetic charges, but we're subtracting the ingoing magnetic charges. So so we're cool. So this then 
is the general formula, which I would conjecture is a non-perturbatively exact uh, formula um, for the soft factor in the presence of electric and magnetic uh, charges. And there are lots of interesting, I think this should be interesting to investigate this formula in the context of theories that do have duality symmetries, because then it has to uh, transform into itself in some, in some interesting way. But uh, nobody's worked that out. Now, um, so the other thing that uh, to say about this, maybe I'll just write it here, is that we also had a conserved charge. Magnet the tilde means magnetic on scry plus, which is the integral over the, over the sphere at the bottom of scry plus of epsilon f. This looks just like the conserved electric charge that we discussed before, except there's no Hodge dual here. And by, by antipodal continuity of the magnetic field, this is equal to uh, um, integral over scry minus, well, it's equal to a similar expression um, defined at integral of f weighted with epsilon at the top of scry minus. So this is the conservation law. And one of the interesting lessons of this is that, so this is a whole new set of symmetries. This set of conservation laws is exactly the same set as the infinite set of electric conservation laws. But if you were presented the theory in the usual gauge invariant form, this, these set of symmetries, these are symmetries of the theory and associated conservation laws, cannot be understood as a non-trivial subgroup of the usual electric gauge symmetry. Um, if we write it in magnetic form, we have the other problem. The magnetic gauge group um, uh, um, the magnetic conservation law and symmetry could be understood as a subset of magnetic gauge symmetry, but we wouldn't have the electric gauge symmetry. Now, it may well be possible to introduce more auxiliary fields and write down some bigger theory with more degrees of freedom that can get constrained away that has all these symmetries. But what the lessons we learn is if somebody hands you a theory, um, it may not be possible with some set of local symmetries manifest. It may not be possible to find um, all of these. I think I'm still going to call this sort of a new phenomena, so I don't know what the right word is. But I think I'm still going to call these things asymptotic symmetries because they act simply on, you know, they act, they're most naturally characterized in terms of their action on the uh, Hilbert space that's described in the asymptotic region at null infinity. So we could still call them asymptotic symmetries. Um, so not all asymptotic symmetries arise uh, from uh, or any particular presentation as, as a non-trivial subgroup of some manifest uh, uh, gauge symmetry. And we're going to see an even more striking example of that uh, later today, and I think there are many. So this kind of leaves us um, not knowing exactly what to do. There seem to be a lot of symmetries around that have important physical consequences, and how do we find and characterize all of them? That's a, that's a, that, that is a, 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 an open question. Um, all right, any questions about that? Um, are these uh, magnetic symmetries, these two tildes, um, is that a purely quantum phenomenon, or is there a quantum field? Everything I said here was, was classical. 
Um, now, I mean, it's a classical statement. It's a the state. It's a classical statement that the charges are conserved. In other words, this 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 formula is a classical formula. And it's a classical formula in both the electric case and and in the magnetic case. Um, which makes it all the more surprising. It could have been discussed 150 years ago or something, but but. But uh, nobody looked at it this way for some reason. Um, OK. So um, any more questions about that? All right. Um, so now I want to make a few sort of comments of a more general nature of something that uh, I've alluded to peripherally at several points, uh, but I want to, but it's important and I want to kind of clarify it. And that's the relationship of this story to the usual discussion of uh, the Goldstone phenomena, spontaneous symmetry breaking, vacuum degeneracy, and so on. Uh, and this, this uh, can be a little confusing. So let me just go over it. So what did Goldstone and his friends say, whoever said it, uh, a long time ago about spontaneous symmetry breaking? So the classic example is a scalar field theory. Let's talk about four dimensions. A scalar field theory, and we have a potential involving a complex scalar V which could be minus phi star phi plus phi star phi squared. So this theory has a, I'm not putting any electromagnetic fields in here. So this theory has a global symmetry under which phi star goes to e to the i theta phi phi goes to e to the i theta phi, and phi star, phi is a complex scalar, goes to e to the minus i theta phi. So this is the Mexican hat potential, and the minimum of the energy is um, any point where, uh, what is it? I, uh, where the derivative of this vanish. It's, it's where phi is equal to 2 phi. Right. So it's phi phi star is equal to a half, which means the absolute value of phi is 1 over the square root of 2. So it's a whole circles. If we look in the phi plane, there's a whole circle's worth of points of phi, which are minima of this potential. So if we want to study excitations of this theory, what we do is we don't really want to study it up here, because if we start it out up here, we make a small perturbation. It'll fall off the top and uh, go all over the place. The vacuum of the theory is down here. And then we study the um, excitations of the theory of, of, about, about the vacuum. Now, so what the first statement is that because the vacuum, so phi vacuum is equal to e to the i theta, where theta is any phase, times 1 over the square root of 2. Now, we, we use the words here that, um, that the global symmetry 
this is a U1 symmetry, the global symmetry is spontaneously broken because uh, the vacuum is, is not invariant. So we could label vacuum by a phase theta and write some charge Q, which generates this uh, symmetry. And uh, Q theta is not equal to 0 because the char the th whatever the object is that generates these transformations would move you from one point on the circle to another. So this is a symmetry of the Lagrangian, but not of the vacuum. So when you have a symmetry of the Lagrangian that's not a symmetry of the vacuum, the words that you say is that that symmetry is spontaneously broken. Or more generally, if it's a symmetry of the equations of motion, and not a symmetry of the vacuum state, you use the words that you say that that symmetry is spontaneously broken. Now, um, Goldstone's theorem says that uh, um, that whenever you have a spontaneously broken symmetry, you always have a light particle associated with it. Um, and that is because we can imagine a s configuration. There's no potential for the field to move in this configuration where, so here we have, let me call this theta naught. So if here we have uh, theta, is equal to theta naught, and on this axis we have position x, we can consider something where the magnitude of phi is always 1 over square root of 2. And, um, and, we, and we do something like this, and um, we vary it a little bit. And if we make this very long, this will be a very low energy mode. In other words, there, can't, there aren't any mass. The energy is non-zero only because the Lagrangian also has kinetic terms, which I didn't write. So there can't be any mass terms for uh, the, the field theta. So we say that um, theta is uh, the Goldstone boson um, for uh, this spontaneous, the Goldstone mode of this spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, another way of saying that is that if we take the global symmetry, delta global of theta, so of a field theta of x, so we can always write phi of x is e to the i theta of x rho of x. And delta global of theta of x is equal to a constant. And delta global of rho is equal to 0. So this, the signature of a Goldstone boson is that it gets an inhomogeneous shift under whatever the symmetry is that is being spontaneously broken. Now, one subtle thing which sort of causes a little bit of confusion is that if you look at this formula, people use, I'm being a little pedantic about this because people use these words in, in so many different ways, but if you look at this formula, we could, we could expand theta in a constant mode and in Fourier modes. And it's only the constant mode that is getting changed under is, is, is getting changed under the symmetry transformation. So a more, more precise language, which people don't use, is to say that the constant mode of uh, the, con the zero mode of theta is the Goldstone boson for uh, is the Goldstone mode for a spontaneous breaking of, of the symmetry. OK, but everybody has different re reasons for adopting certain uh, t uh, terminologies. 
Okay, so what, what is happening here in our examples? Well, we had a charge, Q epsilon. Let's forget about the magnetic stuff. Let's talk about Q, Q plus epsilon. And we found that um, that charge, it was a symmetry of, well, we didn't show it was a symmetry of the Lagrangian because you would have to have a long discussion about, uh, but maybe Burkhardt showed that. Did you show that? You, you have to talk a lot about boundary terms and so on. If you, we showed it was a symmetry of the S matrix, which is, which is if it's a symmetry of the Lagrangian, it's, the, it's certainly a symmetry of the S matrix. Doesn't necessarily go the other way around because people have different ideas about Lagrangians as, as, as far as what the surface terms are. But we, anyway, we showed it was a symmetry of the S matrix. And however, it did not annihilate the vacuum. Instead, it was equal to a some kind of um, soft photon mode, uh, which we wrote out explicitly, which depended on epsilon. It it created a soft photon mode. It created a soft photon on the vacuum whose polarization was the derivative of this epsilon. So that equation looks just like this equation. In other words, uh, we have a symmetry, but it doesn't annihilate the vacuum. Um, now, uh, moreover, we have a vacuum degeneracy because we can have any number, we can act with any number of Q pluses. We can act with uh, any number of A daggers on the vacuum. We can add any number of soft photons on, on the vacuum. So we have an infinite vacuum degeneracy, a much bigger vacuum degeneracy than the vacuum degeneracy here, which is just parametrized by a circle. There's a one vacuum for every point on the circle. Here we have essentially, how else could we, classically we could characterize these vacua by saying that they're given by AZ is equal to DZ epsilon. So these different vacua are characterized by different functions, uh, epsilon on the sphere. So here we have a finite dimensional space of vacua, just parameterized by one angle. Here we have a whole function on the sphere. So, of course, there it's just one symmetry. Here we have infinitely many symmetries. And the fact that we have infinitely many symmetries and they're all spontaneously broken means that we must have infinite uh, vacuum degeneracy. So at the classical level, we can think of these inequivalent vacua as being labeled by different flat U1 connections on the sphere, different pure gauge connections on the sphere. Or we can think of, we start with some fiducial vacuum, and we act on it, and we create uh, a bunch of soft photons, and we get, um, we get uh, new vacua. Now, in that sense, so so that uh, so what that would motivate us to say, and I would use this terminology, that the soft photons are the Goldstone bosons of. Uh, spontaneously broken large gauge symmetry. Now, I say it this way because I, I find that people understand what I'm saying better when I say it this way, but I don't actually need if I'm following this terminology, 
I don't really need to add the word soft there because <laughs> in this example, um, the only thing that gets an inhomogeneous transformation law, uh, the only thing that transforms inhomogeneously is the zero mode of theta. Yet one calls theta the Goldstone boson of U1 global U1 symmetry breaking. So here, it's only the zero modes, the photon zero modes that are transforming under, uh, under this symmetry. Um, but um, I, I guess I keep, I tend to keep this word in here. You, anybody, it's a free world. You can say whatever you want. I, it's not wrong to say that. You could also, I think there was a lot of confusion caused by the fact that people call the whole Goldstone, the whole theta, the Goldstone uh, boson, because, you know, in, in this example it's clear, but in other examples, if you have a number of fields transforming and maybe their zero modes are identified or something like that, it might be the, the terminology gets, gets a little ambiguous. So rather than repeat, propagate a somewhat amb ambiguous terminology, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm using this. Now, in fact, it turns out that the soft photons are the Goldstone bosons of both the electric and the magnetic uh, uh, large gauge symmetry because they, they transform uh, under both of them. Now here is another uh, big difference, though, between these two kinds of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, so in the example on the top blackboard, if you start in this vacuum, phi vacuum is with some fixed theta zero, nothing you do can ever take you out of that vacuum. In other words, if we're here, so suppose we have phi equals e to the i theta zero over square root of two, and then we make a little bubble here, and we make phi, we change the phase here, and then we have a domain, a wall here, where phi has to have a non-zero gradient, this has energy, and it wants to shrink, we, right? This has an energy basically proportional to the volume of the, the area of the wall. And so if you start in this configuration, this thing will shrink, and uh, this, it will, the thing will revert back to the vacuum, the outer vacuum. The bubble won't grow, it will shrink, and you know, radiation may go off and so on. But at the end of the day, um, you, can't, uh, you can't change the asymptotic behavior of, of phi. So it's, and you can show that there is no finite energy configuration um, in which you have some sort of transition at null infinity, where at the beginning of null infinity, you're in one vacuum. At the end of null infinity, you're in the other vacuum. Another way of saying this is that there's no finite energy operators in the theory that take you from one vacuum to the other vacuum. Now, the situation is radically different. I, and by the way, uh, that is true except in one plus one dimensions. In one plus one dimensions, you could do this because then the wall is just a point. So its energy doesn't have to grow as a power of r if you push it out to null infinity. So you could write down a theory in one plus one dimensions um, in which uh, that something like this happens. And indeed, in, in quantum field theory in one plus one dimensions, there's this famous Coleman-Merman-Wagner Merger theorem that says you can't have 
spontaneous symmetry breaking of this type, precisely because this kind of thing uh, can, can and does occur. Now, the situation is radically different here because, uh, in fact, we know we've discussed in detail that, and we've written down formulas, uh, and this is related to, also related to the memory effect, that you can start out with one formula. Well, you can start out at scribe plus minus with AZ equals DZ epsilon. And end up with AZ, you should <laughs> begin and end in some vacuum if you want to talk about finite energy configurations. But you would end up with AZ equals DZ epsilon prime, where epsilon doesn't have to be equal to epsilon prime. And in fact, the difference between these, AZ at scry plus plus minus AZ at scry plus minus, which is dz epsilon prime minus epsilon, the difference between this is, of course, just the integral du du az, which is we call the nz, e squared nz, which is the soft photon. So when you have soft photons, it means that indeed you can change the vacuum. And so, so in this way, it's radically different. Uh, what we would say here, because the word that we would say here in the global case, um, we say that the theory falls into super selection sectors. Right? We fix theta zero. We can talk about you know, theories with different theta zero, but physical processes don't connect them. So we could compute an S matrix in which you allow theta zero to be a parameter. But the S matrix will diagonalize, be diagonalized in theta zero, and and uh, different theta zero sectors uh, won't 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 talk to e won't talk to each other. That's called super selection sectors, and um, so um, these vacua don't form super selection sectors. And one way of thinking about that is it's a symmetry at every angle. The different angles are not tied together. And that makes it like the one plus one dimensional problem. You can imagine a situation in which you're only changing the vacuum at one, at one, at one angle. Or you could change it independently uh, at, 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 uh, at, at every angle. So, when you say that it's a spontaneously broken symmetry, um, that the, the large gauge symmetry is spontaneously broken symmetry, people who are used to thinking about this kind of spontaneously broken symmetry will think that there are super selection sectors. And when you have super selection sectors, you don't get interesting Ward identities uh, in the same way because uh, it maps you to because there isn't really because the operator that that the operator in a sense right in this example that's why I didn't tell you what Q is uh, it takes an infinite amount of energy to uh, to move the angle. So there's because no, there's no finite energy operator in the Hilbert space that 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 changes that changes theta, and so you can't really write down Ward identities for spontaneously broken symmetries with superselection sectors. But here uh, we don't have the superselection sectors. It only takes a finite amount of energy to go from one from one vacuum to the other. Um, any questions about that? That's right. The action it, to go from one to the other is right. infinite. But if uh, it was not, then in principle, we would impose a mechanism which would vacuate with uh, two-dimensional dimensions. And, uh, 
Right. Right, right. Uh, well, that's not what happens here. Um, th these vacua are all exactly degenerate. Um, Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I see. I see. Uh, well, cla I mean, there's classical transitions uh, from one from one to the other. Um, but those are transitions in. We're thinking of this as the slice on which we define our. Yeah, we're thinking of this as the slice on which we define our Hilbert space, not as time, right? So uh, in the analogy that you're trying to draw, these would be transitions in space. These things have exactly zero, these vacua have exactly zero energy, right? If you if you take uh, right, um, if you right, these these vacua have exactly zero energy. Um, these photons carry zero energy by construction. Um, yeah, I don't know how to. I mean, you're trying to draw an analogy which isn't precise. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't quite know how to. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it applies here. But I don't. It does. It does. It doesn't. It doesn't apply here. But I don't. I don't quite know the right way to. Burkhardt? Right. No, it is an operator in the Hilbert space. It takes us. Oh, you mean what is the norm of the state? Uh, right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure of what this this norm of the state. I don't. I'm not sure what uh, the. The norm of the state q plus epsilon is, but we certainly can have physical transitions from one vacuum to another. What? We can have transitions. We certainly we do have transitions. We make soft photons. That's the. No, no. Yeah, 
Ja. So you're, you're getting to the edge of a, a, a the, I don't think the norm has been uh, fully defined for the you know there's a there's tricky issues about uh, limits and so on. Um, I don't think the norm has been fully defined. I think there is. I, I suspect there is a way to def to define it, um, but we certainly wouldn't want to conclude that there are super selection sectors because, you know, I mean, in the case of gravity, the oh, I, gravitational I, memory, yeah. I agree completely. Yeah, yeah. And that theorem, whatever it was, you called it, um, wouldn't apply in one plus one dimensions. And I think that this would be more like the one plus one dimensional case. More questions I can't answer? They're the best kind. What? Why, why is it like more like in the one plus one dimension? Well, you see, the, one of the reasons that you're that you have an infinite amount of energy in higher dimensions for the field, this, this is sort of an intuitive, not a precise answer, but is that you're you're forcing the field to change in the global example over f over distances if you're trying to make this global transformation everywhere, you have to move the field at distance points in, in sim simultaneously, right? So you have, to, you have to move it at very widely separate. So you have to do something over a very big region if you want to make a transformation from one vacuum to another. But these, these, this vacua, we could take an example where epsilon was just had compact support. So, so we're, we we could just work, we could just look at the vacuum at one point on the sphere, or in a neighborhood of one point on the sphere. We're, we can make a vacuum transition without just over here, without also doing something over here. The, it's untethered. These symmetry transformations. The point on the point on the spheres at at null and infinity are not tethered to one another, and so you're not uh, doesn't cost energy in the same way. More questions. Um, Oh, why don't we, um, okay, so that's all review plus BS. <laughs> so our next, our next topic is the soft uh, Fotino theorem. And um, so let's take our five minutes right now. Okay. So, um, so now we're going to talk about um, the uh, soft Fotino theorem. There's something called the soft Fotino theorem that is sort of this you know, supersymmetric theory, the superpartner of the soft photon theorem. Oops. And then we'll see that there are some um, some symmetries associated with that. But before we even write down any formulas and start doing the calculation, I just want to point out that it's it's very puzzling because so we know about the soft photon theorem, 
And if you go to a supersymmetric theory, um, the photon has this super partner called the photino. And so it must be that somehow if you do, if you look at the amplitudes that are under consideration in deriving the soft photon theorem, that you can somehow do a supersymmetry transformation and turn the soft photon into its super partner, the photino, and get some new soft theorem. And in super uh, symmetric theory, everything, or everything has a super partner, including theorems. You have one theorem, and the super transformation of it is. OK, so without even thinking, it's clear that there's going to have to be some soft Fortino theorems. And indeed, there are many, many papers on soft Fortino theorems. Now, another thing that we've learned is that soft theorems, we've given, uh, I guess, really only two examples now, but there are many, many more. Soft theorems are properly interpreted. They are linear relationships among S matrix elements. They relate one kind of scattering amplitude to another. And so they're symmetries of the theory. And moreover, since you can take the soft particle depends on the soft particle momentum. You can take that momentum to zero in any direction. You get not just one symmetry, but you get an infinity of symmetries. Now, if the soft photon theorem is related to a large gauge symmetry, what could the soft photino theorem must somehow be related to some superpartner of the large gauge symmetry. But what could that possibly be? First of all, we know that supersymmetry commutes with gauge symmetry. So we can't, so it's not quite so simple as doing that. Secondly, besides that problem, we're going to get infinitely many fermionic symmetries. And in supergravity, um, you get infinitely many, you have infinitely many diffeomorphism symmetries. You supersymmetrize that, and you get infinitely many fermionic symmetries, local supersymmetries. But in global quantum field theories, which what we're talking about now, the supersymmetric ones, the n equals 1 supersymmetric theory, there are only four global supersymmetries. So where on earth are we going to get infinitely many fermionic symmetries? There's no way to have an infinity of symmetries as a subgroup of a finite number of symmetries. Okay. So there's no way that the fermionic symmetries that before we even start writing anything down, it's clear they're going to be there. There's no way that they can be a subgroup of supersymmetry. They must be something completely new. And uh, with hindsight, this isn't so surprising. Indeed, we've just seen that in the with the magnetic symmetries that uh, um, we couldn't find them as subgroups of the electric gauge symmetry, but we could do something, find some other kind of magnetic gauge symmetry, and then it was a subgroup of that. But how are we going to do that with these infinitely many fermionic symmetries? Uh, and so now we're really beginning to see that the asymptotic symmetries um, are, not, are not always evident. They're there. They're physical symmetries. They, their consequences can be measured, and so on and so forth. But um, they're not uh, subgroups of, of, of gauge symmetries. All right. So let's start by writing down the Lagrangian. I'm not going to write down all of the Lagrangian, because it, 
it gets uh, pretty long. Um, and uh, so we start out, of course, we have the photon, which we're going to normalize in the same way that we have all along. And then in a supersymmetric theory, this photon has a superpartner, the photina, photino, which um, has a spinner index. So, uh, so alpha, alpha and alpha dot are spinner indices which transform in uh, representation of the Lorentz group, which is SL2C. They're two component indices. They transform in um, uh, representation of SL. Alpha dot transforms in one representation of SL2C, and alpha uh, transforms in the complex conjugate representation. So we can write sigma mu alpha alpha dot d mu uh, lambda alpha. I mean, sometimes this would be written as lambda bar d slash lambda, but uh, we want to use this other notation. So these sigma matrices are like gamma 0 times gamma matrices. Uh, lambda alpha and lambda alpha dot have the opposite chirality. And this is the kinetic term. Now, so far, I've just written down a free theory describing a free uh, massless spin a half fermion coupled to a free uh, spin one boson, not coupled. Uh, plus a free spin one boson. Sorry, why is the function known as the chiral? It's not. It's got lambda and lambda bar. Uh, oh. Those are those combine into a direct spinner. Okay. Um, but the two different chiralities don't couple in the massless Lagrangian. OK, so, um, so then what's next? OK, now we want to couple it to matter. Now, if we were doing electromagnetism, we would write a coupling. If we wanted to write the coupling of A, we would write E, or actually in our notation, no, no E. We would write A mu, J mu. But uh, when you have a photino, um, the coupling we can write um, as I k bar alpha dot lambda bar alpha dot. And these alpha dot indices, alpha and alpha dot indices are raised and lowered with the SL2 C invariant epsilon alpha beta minus I K uh, minus I lambda alpha K alpha and there there's plus the matter Lagrangian plus a lot more couplings between here. But this is the only term that I care about. about. This term is there in every whatever um, uh, just like this term is always there when I couple electromagnetism to, ma to charged matter. This term is always there when I couple uh, super electromagnetism. Uh, and, and n equals 1 theory to, to matter. And so k alpha is the super partner of the charge current, because everything is supersymmetric. And in a specific example, and I'm going to work in a specific example, we could try to discuss it more generally, but let's work in a specific example. 
where we have a matter multiplet. Um, we have a field phi bar, phi, it's complex conjugate phi bar. This is a, sp it's a spin zero complex scalar. And then it has a super partner uh, psi alpha and psi bar alpha dot. Now, um, so the current k alpha is equal to q times the square root of 2 phi bar psi alpha and k bar alpha dot is equal to q times the square root of 2 phi psi bar alpha dot. And this is all in the paper which you had in the uh, in, in the reading with uh, um, uh, Dumitrescu, Mitra, and Ha. Okay, so um, good. So this is just a specific example. And notice that the Fotino only couples to charged fields, right? Because it's this coupling is in a supermultiplet mixes up supersymmetry of the Lagrangian, mixes up these two terms. And this one, of course, will also have a Q in front of it. A mu only couples to charge fields. And so it's super partner. Uh, lambda can also only couple to, to charge fields. Now, what is the soft Fotino theorem? Well, the soft Fotino theorem has been derived in the literature. and I'm going to write it down and then explain the notation. So the first thing that we do is we define so a um, and for simplicity, I'm just going to talk about massless fields. Again, there should be a story with massive uh, uh, fields, but the massless cases is simpler. So if we have a massless field with some, the kth, we have k particles, we label them by their momentum p mu k, which we take to be massless. And we can always write for a massless field, sig mu alpha alpha dot is equal to some spinner, eta k alpha, eta bar k, alpha dot. And the fact that it can be written as the, just a product of two spinners guarantees that, um, that p squared uh, is 0 because, well, when we p, p squared can be written as contractions of the eta it's with epsilon alpha beta. So the anti-symmetry guarantees that you can uh, write, write null four vectors in terms of spinners. And similarly, we'll write q mu, um, we'll define q mu sigma mu alpha alpha dot to just be eta alpha, eta bar alpha dot without a, uh, without a k index on it. OK, then now we take the limit as eta goes to 0 which, of course, is also the same thing as q goes to 0. So the soft theorems are, are always written in a limit of uh, small momentum of an S matrix element out. And now we have um, a plus eta, an operator which annihilates a canonically normalized operator which annihilates a single Fotina, Fotino with momentum characterized by eta, S in 
is equal to square root of 2i times the coupling e, which is appearing in the, in the Lagrangian there, times the sum. So we have one term for every outgoing particles. I'm going to label the outgoing particles by k times some quantity, which for now I'm going to call f sub k. We'll define it in a moment over eta dot eta k, where this is epsilon alpha beta, eta alpha, eta k beta. I should put this index up, I guess. Eta dot eta k out s in minus the same thing for in states. So minus the sum k in n of the same thing. OK. Now I have to tell you what fk is. So something a little different is happening now than in all the examples that we've discussed before. In all the examples that we've discussed before, we had something like this with a sum over outgoing particles. Um, but the thing that sat here, the so-called soft factor, was just a number. But we could have thought of it as an operator, where the operator, we, we had the q dot p. Notice this is like the q dot p, or it's really the square root of the q dot p. Um, but we could have thought of this as the charge operator acting on the kth particle, and its eigenvalue would be the charge of the kth particle. So we aren't doing anything to the kth particle. Here it's a little more, it's a little different. Um, this uh, fk um, takes the kth particle, it's an operator which acts on the kth particle and changes it to something else. And how does that work? So let's define how this thing acts on single, fk acts on single particle states. And f on a single psi particle is minus q on a phi particle. And f on a psi bar particle is q sorry f on a phi bar particle is uh, q on psi bar and then we also have the conjugate relations that phi acting on a bra f is minus q um, psi bar f is q phi bar. All right, so let's discuss some properties. So first of all, these things have the same um, the same momenta. So if we act on a state with, uh, on, a, on a, a fermion with um, one momentum, we get a, a single particle fermion state with one momentum. We get a single particle boson state with the same momentum. Now notice that this operator f, um, what are some properties of it? First of all, it's a fermionic operator because it's changing fermions to bosons and bosons to fermions. Okay, so it changes fermion number. Um, secondly, it conserves charge. So psi and phi have the same charge. Psi bar and phi bar have the same charge. So it 
it conserves charge. Um, it does nothing to particles without any charge. So it, if we have some outgoing state that doesn't carry charge, it's, it doesn't enter into the soft factor. And that's just like in the soft photon theorem, it only, the soft factor only involves particles with, without, without, uh, without going charge. Um, notice also that um, the things that I didn't write down, like f on psi bar, would are just uh, zero. And um, well, the reason for that could be traced basically to some kind of helicity con or spin conservation. This has some spin a half. F has spin a half. We have to make something with spin zero. And so it's only certain combinations that we can get something non-zero. Now, this is an operator which changes fermions to bosons. It's not supersymmetry, for sure. So supersymmetry acts on everything, not just things with charge. And the details of it are also different. Supersymmetry uh, mixes up fields, bo uh, changes a, a, a fermion into a derivative of a boson. It squares to a translation. Uh, this isn't doing that. This is just a, a different operator. It's not uh, not supersymmetry. But maybe the most important thing is that supersymmetry doesn't uh, care about charge. So there's another interesting operator with that we can define that's not supersymmetry. Now, in various superspace formalisms, which I'm not going to go into, there's certain combinations of theta derivatives and uh, in superspace that are the supercharge. And then there's some others that just kind of trail along in the discussion and are not the supercharge. This is related to one of those others that isn't quite supersymmetry. OK, now we can understand qualitatively. I'm not going to try to derive this, the soft Photino theorem in detail. But we can understand qualitatively why this happens. So let's suppose that um, we had a, some S matrix element. And we attach a photon. Um, so we have some scalar phi here. And um, we, we, as the photon, and we have the same scalar phi here. right? So a, a photons couple scalars to scalars. But now if we make this a photino, look at this vertex over here. This coupling will be through this vertex, which couples lambda, the photino, see, if it were the charge current, this would be a phi phi star. It would couple phi to phi. But if we have a photino that comes in here, this vertex has to change um, phi to its super partner, psi. But it doesn't do it exactly by a supersymmetry transformation. It does it by something involving this f. Right? So first of all, this vertex is 0 if phi doesn't carry any charge. So this is where the f comes from. Um, when we take the soft, we start out, if we started out where, with, where the external line was a psi, and we coupled in a soft photino and truncated this, and looked at the reduced S matrix element, the new reduced S matrix element would involve a different particle, not the psi. It would involve the phi. And so, so this, so this uh, structure looks, um, 
looks quite uh, natural from, from that point of view. OK, that is the standard soft Fotino theorem. Let me uh, uh, just pause for questions before I get started. How is it defined? Yeah, good, good, good question. So, so uh, wait. <laughs> okay, let me write it down here. So suppose I had f k, and I need to write it out in a little bit more detail. I'm, I'm trying to, these equations get so long, I, I'm trying to you know, shorten them by introducing more and more abbreviated notation. And when I do that, sometimes it will be, become so abbreviated that it's no longer clear what I'm saying. I, apparently, that's just just happened. So let me try to explain it in a little more detail. So I have this thing here, which I now want to write as fk p1 pn s in. So this is one of the things that acts on the out state. And I'm even abbreviating here, of course, because the particles are not labeled just by their momenta. They're labeled by all their quantum numbers and and everything. Okay. So what this is equal to is P1 dot 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 F acting on the kth particle PK dot 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 PN S out. Right? Now, if f, instead of, in the soft photon theorem, f is just the charge operator. So this is just a number times the original state. And I can pull it back out. And this is just a number that multiplies the whole amplitude. But now I can't do that anymore. Uh, I have to compute the new amplitude with the, with the super partner. Uh, well, the f partner, I guess I should call it, of of the um, of the kth particle, and so I have to do that to all the particles in here one at a time, and so I have one such term for every outgoing particle, and every out incoming particle, and I also have to multiply by this factor at the same time. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I could have, of course, def defined the whole thing to be f, but I didn't do that because f here doesn't involve eta. It doesn't know anything about the soft photon. It's just a factor that that only knows about the particle. Now, it's a good thing this happened because, of course, every uh, S matrix element has to conserve fermion number mod 2. So if the in state has an even number of fermions, the out state has an odd number of fermions. So if I'm not acting with if fk, this is an S matrix element between an even number of fermions and an odd number of fermions, which is always going to be 0. But when I act with fk, I'm taking and I'm changing the fermion number of an out state by 1, so that fk on out is a state then with the, if, it start, if out is an odd number of fermions, fk on out is an even number of fermions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in terms of round theory, the gauge is always one. Uh, that's the 
promoted to a full title position. And then usually people go to something like Judge and Audition or some stuff like that. But the Sphinx is exactly the, the, the non part of the title. No, it's no, it's not just it's uh, it's more complicated. We we thought that this symmetry at first we thought that this symmetry might somehow, you see. There are many ways. So, there are many ways of writing off-shell supermultiplets, and it's a somewhat random procedure. And there are different formalisms for doing it. And it could have, got, it could have, there might be a formalism in which all of this is very simpler and simple, and indeed, but, uh, but the off-shell formalism is not universal. The soft theorems are universal, but the off-shell formalism isn't. So there's no guarantee that, that that these are going to be the simplest possible thing. You could certainly write them. We're able to write them on the off-shell supermultiplets, but they're not, they're not the, the simplest possible thing. Which lead to this uh, uh, soft photon contribution. But here it seems like you compare uh, the scattering uh, amplitude with uh, its uh, superpartner ones, right? But why we need to do that? I mean, does the detector cannot dis distinguish the like the boson production or the uh, partner production? Say, say here you 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 produce a phi, but you compare with the diagram, which produce a lambda with the yeah. phi, right? So, so I, 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 uh, two different it may be true that physical detectors can't, can't, um, uh, any physical detector that there, that there's a limit on what any, any physical de detector can detect. But I would not jump from that statement to the statement that it's not interesting to try to have an S matrix. And um, now, there, there are problems constructing the S matrix when, when you um, have soft photons. It's believed to exist. Well, actually, people have shown that it exists, but it's sort of complicated to discuss in this Fide of Coolish construction. And uh, one of my hopes about this program is that, you know, the problems with there, there's, uh, you know, now we have found that there are an infinite numbers of symmetries that govern the infrared behavior of the theory. And these were never used in trying to understand or characterize the S matrix, um, and that perhaps it it can it 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 can shed light on this problem. But certainly in this class, we want to be assuming and talking about uh, an S matrix because we can't have symmetries without an S matrix. I mean, the symmetry is a symmetry of an S matrix. We assume that there's an exactly unitary theory including the soft sector. And um, I think it's very problematic to assume that the unitarity does not extend all the way down to the soft sector. I don't I don't I don't I don't know what I don't know what I don't know what that is. So we are um, uh, assuming you know soft particles are real. Uh, for, and um, we haven't talked much about, I mean, they're real physical excitations of the Hilbert space. So for example, oh, another thing I wanted to say about these vacua is that the different degenerate vacua with different number of soft photons, they have the same energy, but they have different angular momentum, which is another way of understanding why they're, they're different. 
So, I mean, I want, I am arguing that these states are uh, physically equivalent. Um, we will discuss a little bit later more about how you measure the differences between different vacuo when we get to the memory effect. But in the photon case, we assume that the vacuum plus the cell photon, or I'd say we showed it. I would say that that this um, that this this analysis demonstrates it that the vacuum plus the cell photon is a different state. And similarly here, if we add a uh, a cell photino, we change the the spin and the fermion number of the vacuum. So it's it's a different okay. it's a different state. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, now. So somehow, given what we've learned so far in the course, we strongly suspect that that this is um, somehow related to uh, an infinite number of symmetries, which clearly are going to be fermionic symmetries. Now, how do we figure out what those are? Well, there would be the brute force method, which never works in almost any problem, of trying to take this uh, thing and just rewriting it in, in, in some way um, as some set of charges um, uh, that act on, um, on scribe plus. A better approach at, at null infinity. A better approach is to just kind of look at this formula and try to guess what the symmetries might be, write down some charges, and then after you've done that, verify that, that the charges are conserved and that their ward identity is this soft theorem. That's a more practical approach. Uh, now, the first thing is, notice that this soft Photino theorem has the same form as um, the soft photon theorem in the sense that um, there's a, so, so we want to write this in the, in the form out uh, some f plus s minus s f minus n is equal to zero. If we succeed in writing this in that way, then f is the thing that gener whatever transformation f generates, that's the new fermionic symmetry. Now it's clear here that this, like the soft photon th case, the soft photon case, the charge had a soft part. Remember, we started with a charge defined at scribe plus minus. We integrated by parts, and we got a soft part, which was linear in the electromagnetic field operator, and then a hard part, which involved the matter field. So we wrote it as Q is equal to Q soft, linear in electromagnetic field plus the second term, which involved the charge current. This has exactly the same form. There's a soft part, only now instead of involving a soft uh, photino, it soft photon involves a soft photino, and now we have a hard part, and instead of involving just electromagnetic gauge transformation, it involves this funny fermionic F-symmetry. So the soft part clearly has to be linear in the photino in order to get that first term. So somehow we're guessing that, uh, that there's a term which involves an f, which somehow is linear in the photino lambda, some kind of integral linear in lambda, and weighted by some fermionic function which we will call chi 
instead of epsilon. Now, somehow supersymmetry should come into this. And um, we, we know that supersymmetry commutes with gauge transformations. So we can't get it this um, fermionic charge by taking the large gauge charge and commuting it with supersymmetry. But it's possible that we might be able to do the other thing. In other words, it's possible that we might be able to take the fermionic charge, commute it with supersymmetry, and get back what we already knew about the large gauge charge. And indeed, that seems like it has to happen because anything which is linear in lambda under a supersymmetry transformation, um, delta lambda, so there's supersymmetry transformations which are characterized, they have indices alpha and alpha dot. They're fermionic transformations. So we have supersymmetry ch transformations which have the property that delta, so I didn't tell you what the supersymmetry transformations were, but of course they're well known. Um, it's equal to minus F alpha beta plus dot, 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 where this thing is F mu nu, sigma mu nu, uh, I guess I should write it as sigma mu, no, I can write as sigma mu nu alpha beta, where this is the commutator of, anti-commutator of two sigmas. And um, so this is minus F uh, alpha beta plus, um, so we know that under supersymmetry, fermions change into derivatives of bosons, so the photino will transform into the derivative of the photon, and the only gauge invariant formula is that it would transform into F. And again, this is the only formula that we could write down with this index structure that could possibly be the supersymmetry transformation. And if you don't like that, you can look it up in Weston Bagger. And then there's more stuff here involving the matter fields and the D terms, which doesn't matter for the purposes of, of our discussion. So I'm just, I'm just going to leave that out. So it's clear that there is no possibility that um, for the fermionic conserved charges to commute with supersymmetry because we're going to get Fs here. And there's no, no way for them to be, no way for them to vanish. So something good had better happen. And so what covariant um, equation could we write down? Well, let, let so uh, zeta alpha delta alpha Susie. on F, which will depend on a spinner, which with an index we'll call, will depend on some, some spinner chi, um, that should somehow equal the large gauge symmetry with some parameter epsilon. But we have to make that parameter epsilon out of, um, uh, so let's say this is a chi with an alpha index. That's the one that uh, we're, we're using up there. So this generates a supersymmetry transformation with, with a supersymmetry spinner, zeta alpha. What can that be? Well, there's only one. So it can only involve zeta and chi. So the only thing that makes sense 
is q zeta dot chi. And moreover, it had better be that zeta alpha dot, delta alpha dot, su z, f of chi is equal to zero if we're only if we're constructing f of chi with an undotted spinner indice. Of course, there's a second f here. There's a second set of transformations that I haven't discussed. And it all goes back to here. I could have started out with a negative Felicity guy. And then I would have had a different kind of f, which had a different chirality and uh, different set of transformation laws. And I would end up having dotted spinners instead of undotted spinners. And this would be 0. And this would be q zeta dot chi dot. Okay? So this is the only formula. If you stare at this, this is the only formula that, uh, that makes any sense. And um, OK, so now I'm, I'm, I'm not, I think I'm not going to try to start on this. This is maybe a good place to end. Um, I'm not going to start. I'm, so now we can try to see this is looking promising because we know that q can be written as an integral over scry plus minus of the field strength f. So it doesn't seem, and given that lambda itself transforms into f, it doesn't seem like it's going to be very hard to write down an f with this uh, property. Actually, it seems like it would be so easy that I could do it in the next five minutes. And that then you, that, that would be the obvious guess, and you'd write that down, and then you would go through it. Okay, but but there's a wrinkle. And the wrinkle is that the components that the field equations imply that the components of lambda uh, have interesting, uh, and some of them actually diverge as. Uh, it's scry plus minus. So they can diverge linearly with u. It's a little bit like what you saw in the homework. Maybe it's a slightly different phenomenon, but um, where, where the subleading components of epsilon uh, w w diverged it for, for of the gauge transformation uh, d diverged at, 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 at large or small u. But anyway, Typically, the boundary conditions on this lambda uh, uh, do not force it to go to a finite finite energy in the boundary condition. Do not force it to go to a constant large u. So we have to do a very subtle uh, projection to get rid of that, to get a well-defined quantity. And so, basically, after we do that production projection, there's a well-defined finite p. And after we do that projection, then uh, it, there's something that, that simply obeys this relation. But, but that, uh, that's an instructive exercise, but it takes half an hour, not, not three minutes. Um, let me ask if there are any questions.